So welcome again, everybody. We appreciate you being here. As people join, um, we'll just kind of get them caught up, but feel free to use the chat function to ask questions, tell us where you're calling in from, uh, what you're up to today. If, you're, if you have anything special open, um, we'd love to hear that too. Uh, so we are very excited to be able to talk to you today about clones in Pinot Noir, uh, which is a topic that comes up, I think, pretty often for all of us, especially as we're out in the world talking to our industry and trade professionals. Uh, it's something that is not unique, but particular about Pinot Noir that I think comes up more than probably any other varietal that we're, that we're out there. So I'll quickly introduce everybody. Uh, that's me on the left, Mari as you can see uh, from the video. And then we've got Kirk, he's up there in the shop. Uh, Kirk is our vineyard manager and also one of our partners here. And then we've got David there, uh, also a partner and our winemaker. So we've got quite the team here uh, to talk about clones, which I think what's interesting to bring together kind of the vineyard side and the winemaking side is that you kind of get different perspectives on it. Um, you know, Kirk being the farmer, and thinking about how do these clones grow? How do we uh, get the best product from them to make the best wine? And then David, how do we treat them in the cellar to, to kind of get the best expression of the clones and also of the site? So kind of building on what we did last week or two weeks ago, um, but a little bit of a different topic. So uh, just to refresh everybody, here we are. We are in the Russian River Valley, AVA of Sonoma County. So Hallberg Ranch is right there in the Green Valley primarily. Uh, and then we have a secondary vineyard, Pino Hill, that's in the very southern part of Russian River, uh, right on the edge of the Petaluma Gap in the Russian River. So kind of uh, gets a little bit of that Petaluma Gap influence as well. Um, in the Russian River, fog is the biggest impact on climate that you're gonna have. Uh, and then also um, the, the impact of fog is really gonna dictate our growing seasons and um, the differences in all these areas in Sonoma County. So what makes Russian River versus Petaluma Gap has so much to do with that fog intrusion. So Sebastopol Hills where Pino Hill is, is actually the coldest, foggiest, and windiest. And Green Valley is the second coldest and um, foggiest region in Russian River Valley, although it's not as windy as the Sebastopol Hills. Uh, so with that, let's dive into clones. Um, so I think this will be a quick overview for most people. I think almost probably everybody on this call has an idea of what a clone, a field selection is, but always good to go back to the basics just so we're all on the same page. Um, and I'll throw to David and Kirk a little bit as well here, but basically with Pinot Noir, there's you know anywhere from 200 to probably over a thousand different unique Pinot Noir clones. And that really just reflects the genetic instability of Pinot Noir. If you plant a seed from Pinot Noir, you are likely to get a completely different um, genetic material than the parent, than the parent plant. Um, so basically all grapevines, we're just cloning a parent. So we're taking material and propagating them to the next vine via grafting. We're not actually planting seeds so that each plant is genetically identical to the parent plant, which is why it's called a clone, right? It's just cloned. <laughs> um, but a field selection is a slightly different take on it. It's kind of the old way of doing it where you just find some plants that you like that are desirable vines and you just graft them onto other, you know, basically vines. They're not necessarily genetically the same. Uh, however, you could clone a field selection and get it registered and numbered and that would become a clone. If you don't register and number it, it just stays a field selection instead of calling it a clone. So at this point in time, it's almost like two, two different um, words for the same thing, <laughs> but uh, having them registered is what makes it a clone. So we have Heritage Clones and Dijon Clones, and I'll toss it over to Kirk a little bit to talk about these, but um, Heritage Clones have basically been propagated in California uh, for over 100 years. And uh, the most common ones are Mount Eden, which is also called Mary Edwards Clone, Calera, Swan, uh, and Dijon Clones were studied extensively in Dijon and Burgundy in the 1980s. They were brought to the US and those are all registered and numbered. So Kirk, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about uh, kind of the difference with heritage clones and Dijon clones and uh, the origin stories of the two. All right, um, Mari's a little bit incorrect. Um, oh, even better. <laughs> I, hate, I hate to correct her, but uh, Swan, I guess you could call a heritage clone, Joseph Swan, 
took it from Romani Conti. Phone 37 was brought in by, uh, uh, not by Mary Edwards. She made a selection from Mount Eden Vineyard right. and it was stolen from Romani. It's like our elite clone. I stole it from Romani and we've got an elite clone. The true heritage clones are, and they're actually, Pomard is one of the old uh, clones. Uh, it's been around a long time from the Pomard region of Burgundy. The other is um, Martini 13, which was the original Pinot Noir grown here in California. Uh, they've got some selections of that that are called Jackson clones. Jackson 9, Jackson 13. They were found in a foothill vineyard uh, over near the uh, Highway 49, the Gold Rush area. And it was a vineyard that was abandoned and somebody made selections out of it. They liked what they had and so they propagated that. The Swan, Calera, Elite, uh, Mount Eden, they're actually field selections, but uh, Mount Eden has gone through the Davis process of selection and Davis gave it the number 37. Swan now has a, a number, I guess somebody sent it over to Davis or Davis themselves uh, cataloged it and, and described its, what, how that particular uh, clone grows and that's now called clone 97. Elite is just elite. It's our own selection. We love it to death and uh, we have no desire to run it through the catalog selection. The Dijon clones, um, there are different, it, it gets confusing. They were um, cataloged by the University of Bourgogne in Dijon, as good as I can do on that one. Um, with like 777 uh, was the Davis number, and I believe it's like 173 in the Dijon catalog. The two are crossing, they aren't using the same numbers, it gets a little confusing. So if you need to buy vines, you say UC Davis 777. And if the nursery works with the Dijon uh, nurseries, they've got like 173, uh, confusing. Each of the clones, Mari was talking about how they're up to a thousand clones. They are all technically field selections. Some grower went out in the field and like the, or some winemaker went out, liked the flavor of, the, of from a certain vine. He wanted more of that flavor. So he took that selection to a nursery. They propagated it and gave it a number. A lot of them uh, were selected for the Champagne region. They want high production. Uh, fairly high acid fruit. They want five tons to the acre uh, because they can do it. They need, they're going to pick the fruit at a lower sugar reading, a lower bricks. And so those clones tend to be very large and uh, highly productive. The, we'll, we'll use the 777-667-115. Those are Dijon clones that were selected for either aromatics, clone 115 tends to be very aromatic, uh, or for structure or tannins, 777 and 667 are two clones that tend to have more tannins. And Pomard is Pomard. Pomard uh, is Pomard both in Burgundy and here in California. So that should give you a pretty good idea. The cluster sizes tend to be smaller on the Dijon clones. There are a few larger ones. Uh, the 828 is a fairly large, high producing clone, but it makes a very nice Pinot Noir, similar to Pomard. And Pomard's a pretty uh, heavy producer. So that's my Dijon or my clonal speech. Uh, some maintain the names, some have been cataloged and given numbers. Yeah, I think that's a good kind of uh, thing to remember. Every clone basically starts out as a field selection. Uh, that's kind of the old way of doing it. But when uh, the university in Dijon started to actually select these and, you know, uh, number them and study them, that's really when they, you know, started to be called a clone. Um, Dave, I just want to throw it to you too. I feel like you probably have some things to add or 
to <laughs> comment on it as well, especially with the Dijon clones. Well, I think, um, you know, I started making Pinot Noir back before, the, or just before, or just as the Dijon clones were coming across. This was down in Carneros. And so we were making Pinot Noir from an old martini vineyard down on Cuttings Wharf. And, um, you know, we heard words like martini and Jackson and all these kicked around. Um, and then we heard some cholera because, you know, Josh Jensen was down there. We we heard of those. So they were, they were sort of these mythical clones. Um, they were planted in a very old fashioned way. Most of them were virused at that point. And, you know, when the Dijon clothes started coming in, everyone was very, very excited. Um, but, you know, those were primarily or often selected to be early ripeners. Um, and so um, these days, you know, I think there's been this sort of movement back toward um, some of the heritage clones because they, they weren't necessarily selected for um, early ripening. And in California, you know, if you have a very early ripening clone, you might be picking in July or early August. And no, no winemaker really wants to do that. You know, <laughs> the whole idea is hang time, hang time um, for flavor development. So uh, there's, there's, you know, always an interest in these um, sort of exotic older clones um, because they are a little better adapted perhaps to a lot of the growing conditions that we have here. Um, that's really, that was maybe more Carneris' um, issue, you know, here in, in, in Green Valley or down at Pinot Hill you know, early ripening, even with some of these new Dijon, newer Dijon clones, it's not such an issue. But, um, and just as Kirk was mentioning, you know, these things are, you were mentioning, Mari, that, um, uh, you know, these are field selections. They were selected uh, based on their winemaking traits. And if you go into the early, the Dijon catalog, it will say, this is not a complete wine. This is prized for aromatics, or there are a few um, that say that this wine can, this clone can actually make a complete wine all on its own, but um, it's rare that any vineyard or winemaker wants to make wine from a single clone. Yeah, and you know, and when we say there's, you know, up to a thousand different Pinot Noir clones or field selections, uh, you know, only around 15, maybe 20, if you're going to push it, are really significant in commercial winemaking. So you're not going to, you know, when you're drinking, even if you drink a lot of Pinot Noir, like, like we all do, you're probably not encountering many more than maybe 20 of these clones. So uh, that does kind of narrow the band of the kind of profiles that you're going to see, but also within that, there's still such a difference. I mean, we have 11 clones planted at Hallberg, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, there is such a difference that you can get from, from all these clones. Um, all right, so Pinot clones in the new world. Uh, Tijon is, like Dave was saying, it has been most popular. Um, 115667 and 777 um, are some of the most widely planted, uh, but very often blended with um, other clones, other heritage clones in particular. Um, and it seems the, the best information that we could get is that there are 43 certified Dijon clones right now uh, in the catalog from, um, from France. So uh, Dave got a good question for you from Stacy. So she said, I've experienced winemakers who do make single clone Pinot Noir. Why wouldn't you recommend that? Oh, it's not so much that I wouldn't recommend it. And I, did, I see that, saw that comment. In fact, we hear we have several wines, two or three wines, or maybe four that are um, single clone bottlings. Yeah, I think um, what you do run the risk there, you know, it's in any given vintage, um, certain clones will rise to the top. And sometimes it's the unexpected clone that maybe is a, a strong B plus year in and year out, and you'll have a vintage where it just makes this exceptional wine. Um, so you never really know. So I think, you know, in the case of our Hallberg wine, our Hallberg Ranch blend, that has upwards of 11 clones in it each year, you, 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 are, you have to stand a better chance of making a very complete and balanced wine. Once you want to drill down into smaller, more special bottlings to really highlight a particular character, make a more character driven wine, then certainly you can make one from a single clone. I'm just saying, generally speaking, if you want the whole aromatic profile and a fuller structure, having multiple clones at your disposal is, is a benefit. Yeah. So we talk about clones and obviously they all have, um, they're all selected for different aromatics or uh, flavor profile or textural characteristics, but how do those things, you know, get affected when you then plant them in different places or different seasons? So what kind of terroir uh, kind of effects do we see in the clones? So 
rainfall is a big one, wind, soil nutrients, and the soil that it's planted in, sunlight days, heat days, crop load. I mean, you could go on and on, but basically where the clone is planted also matters. And this is kind of what we're gonna dive into in the next, you know, five slides or whatever we have left. So uh, this is just kind of our snapshot of what we have growing, our dry farm vines at Hallberg. Uh, and how we can kind of best capture the expression of clones. And if you missed it, we'd be happy to send you the recording from last week where we kind of dive into terroir and kind of the effects that humans can have on terroir and what that means. But we'll kind of just focus on uh, clones for today. So these are just six of the clones that we have planted here at Hallberg. We actually have 11. These are some um, beautifully stylized photography. Uh, but you can see here, that every clone really has a different uh, physical characteristic uh, from smaller berries to larger berries, bigger clusters, smaller clusters. Uh, you can see Elite in particular, that's our own field selection in that bottom left. It has the two wings on the side. Uh, so these are some of the differences that you see physically in the clones that really make uh, those differences that we see in the wines that we talk about in terms of structure, style, et cetera. Um, I don't know if Dave or Kirk, you have anything to add on this side, otherwise we can go to the next, but I want to toss it to you both. Yeah, you can go ahead and roll to the next slide. All right, let's Kirk. do it. Here is we similar. Go. Um, so like I said, we have 11 clones and field selections planted here. They all are unique and, and, and interesting and different. Um, but some clones are a little bit more expressive of their, of their uniqueness to you know, no matter where they're planted, and some are a little bit more expressive of their site. Uh, I also think what's really interesting on this slide is you can see the difference in 8 to 8 from two different blocks. Uh, at the bottom left, you have D block, and then the one next to it is from G block. And even just where it's planted is going to make a big difference on uh, that, you know, expression of that, um, of the physical growth and you know the characteristics. So Dave, I'd love to toss to you right now and, and hear a little bit about what you see as some of the differences coming across the vineyard because as you know, you know and I know, um, we actually have a lot of these clones planted in multiple locations across the vineyard. So I'd love to toss to you, Dave, and, and have you talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that that the the contrast between D and G block is fascinating. I mean G is a little bit further up the slope where the soils the soil drains a little bit quicker, things warm up a little bit. The berries, you know, just through lack of a little less moisture probably in the soil, the Kirk could speak to this better, they just don't size up as much. Um, so you can there's probably berry weight, berry size differences between the D and the G. Um, uh, you're looking at the elite, you mentioned the, um, the wing phenomenon on that particular selection or clone. Um, what that does uh, is those wings tend to be always a little bit lagging behind in ripeness. So they can have much higher acidity in those wings, which is something we really prize in that clone. Uh, you know, some winemakers might want those cut off because they want a more uniform bricks throughout the cluster. But I actually think that the high tone aromatics we get out of the elite wines is as a result of those those wings that have almost like white fruit components, peach, peach and nectarine quality, which I really love. Um, something that you can't really tell by looking at the, the cluster morphology is what's going on on the inside of those things. And I'll, I'll, if you look at Pomard and 667, you know, those are classic cluster shapes up there on the top tray. Um, but the difference between the two on the insides might be the size of the seeds or the numbers of the seeds. Um, when, you, when I am sampling the fruit or stomping on the grapes uh, as we're tracking the ripeness, I'm always struck by how clone the hide selection and the 37 have very, very small seeds. Um, and so that'll affect the overall tannin structure of the finished wine. So those two wines, while making very, very dark wine, can be very soft and tannin because the seeds are much smaller versus something like Pomard and, and 667 whose seeds you know, almost fill out the entire berry structure sometimes. So there's less juice and a lot of potential tannin. Um, larger buried clones like the 828 can have a very juicy sort of primary fruit component, um, a lot of floral notes. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's really amazing just looking at these. This is from, you know, one variety from a single ranch and just see how much different you see. And then Kirk, how about you? What, what kind of differences do you see throughout the vineyard as, you know, 828 is an example here that we're showing, but even some other clones, planted in different areas, uh, having 
differences and similarities between the clone? Well, I like using the 777 because it, it, we've got it in two extremes. We've got it over in C block, which is on the lower end of the ranch, where the Goldridge soils are five to seven feet deep. And we also have it over in M block, which is at the highest point of the vineyard, which is very high and it's about the series play. The commonality is, is that 777 is a, uh, Great that tends to have tannin structure, uh, but the qualities of the place change. Uh, the tannins are a little less prevalent in the uh, C block in the Gold Ridge soil, but you tend to get a little more floral, a little more cherry. And over in M block, you get a little more earthiness, but they still are 777. So th that's a good example of. That's a good example of place in relation to a clone. Uh, David will probably tell you something similar about that. Um, uh, it's kind of fun, but these clones, where we've got them, uh, the 37, we have in two, now we have in three locations. We'll find out how that does. The, the one clone is in the same soil profile within the ranch, about the same elevation, same slope, just on one side of the highway from the other. And we just grafted uh, some 37 onto a highly vigorous site, but 37 is one of those clones that I do not thin or thin very lightly because it is a very small clone. If you look at those pictures, 37 is a very small clone, five clusters to six clusters per pound. 115 is a smaller clone, um, 667 is an interesting one. It's a bigger, actually a longer rachis, which is the stem through the center of the cluster, than the 777, but it's, it's uh, ampelography, which is, if you were looking at that cluster, is a much looser cluster. Uh, I kind of like it. Uh, we use it in our Wesley Reserve quite a bit. Uh, but there's, each one of these clones reacts to its site, but still maintains what it was selected for. So like I say, 667, 777 tend to have more tannins, give you a little more structure. 115, where you, whether you have it uh, at the bottom of the ranch or the upper end of the ranch tends to be floral, they're a small cluster. Uh, Pomar and A28 tend to give you those texture uh, fruit texture, viscosity kind of thing. So they react based on where they're at. They'll give you a little more of one part that makes them classic. And they also show a different part in another part of the vineyard where the, that uh, it's not as prevalent. We were talking about weather too. Uh, and David was talking about how vintage has changed. And I'm gonna use that 777 again because it's an easy example but it tends to be in cool years, the 777 that's in our drier area tends to uh, do better than the 777 in the cooler part, part of the vineyard or the lower part of the vineyard, because I think it actually, due to water stress and some of the ways we manipulate the vines, determines uh, the amount of structure the, vine, the, the fruit's going to have and that is changed by the weather. So in a hot year, your fruit tends to get better in cooler areas. In cool years, the areas that are warmer tend to do better for making wine. So David's very fortunate. He can pick grapes from either any part of the ranch. And uh, based on the vintage, he can manipulate the wine to show off Halberg, but it's always Halberg. Yeah, and Dave, for you, are there I'm curious what clones you see uh, morph a little bit more uh, in their flavor, texture, you know, physiology, uh, depending on site and which ones maintain a little bit more of their uniqueness. Um, I think, you know, since we have these clones in not only multiple locations in Hallberg, but also between here and, and uh, Pino Hill, the oh, 37. You it up great. Yeah, 37, <laughs> look at that. Um, 37 is very consistent. Um, so here's the elite slide. You can see that the, 
the, the overall shape is kind of the same. It's just mm -hmm. the scale of the cluster is different. But that little, that little dangly tendril thing that has berries on it, the wing, um, sometimes those don't even color up or you'll see one or two white, almost Chardonnay looking berries on that little side branch. And again, there's where your acidity comes from. And so in both locations, the Elite makes a highly acidic wine with incredible perfume, but also very, very dark. Um, there's a lot of, you can see the berry, um, the size irregularity, big berries, little berries. Sometimes that's called chicks and, chicks and hens. So that, that's, um, the smaller berries can really help um, pump up the color because the skin to juice ratio is much higher. Um, 37 is consistent on both uh, across Hallberg and also between um, Hallberg and Pino Hill. Um, there's a, there, it's a very, very dark wine, um, very plush, and there's a meaty, um, almost oily element to that, um, that clone or selection that's consistent kind of no matter where we plant. Um, perhaps 115 um, on Hallberg, uh, and Kirk already mentioned 777 has very different character depending on where it's planted. Um, 115 can be very, very floral if it's planted on a heavier or cooler site. Um, you can see that little tendril um, hanging off also on 115. If that's present, which it can be on the cooler sites, you'll have um, heightened aromatics, higher acidity. Um, we have it in a couple locations that's where it's a little warmer and it produces a very dark and meaty wine. Sometimes some vintages and warmer vintages almost unrecognizable as 115. Um, it's just amazing to see how these things behave depending where they are. But um, hide is pretty consistent from between, um, we have it in one site here at Hallberg and then one site down at Pinot Hill and it, those wines, you can recognize the high character and it's sort of fleshy, uh, faded flower uh, quality that I really, really like. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna throw this one to both of you, another question. Um, and we'll kind of keep diving into this a little bit more, but how does the soil type um, affect the clone's flavor and aroma? And so, if you're thinking about Hallberg or Pinot Hill, um, or the comparison of the two for us, I think that there's a big difference on what clone it is. And so that's kind of what Dave was just describing. So looking at this elite, um, there is a similar physiological characteristic. There's a similar air aroma and, you know, kind of structure characteristic. Uh, but where it's grown is going to have a big impact on the wine that's made. So I would love for you guys to both comment on that too, though. Kirk, you want to take that first? <laughs> well, I mean, when we're talking about sites, uh, Pinot Hill is so much windier, so much colder, so much less sunlight uh, than the Hallberg Vineyard. And the Hallberg Vineyard is cool compared to vineyards farther to the north and east of us. Um, but the soils are still Goldbridge soils. The underlying material is a little bit different between the two. But uh, that's when climate really has an effect on the clone and the clusters and everything else. In those slides, you see that because it's so cold, the rachis doesn't extend, which is that stem in the middle of the cluster, doesn't extend as far. It stays fairly short, uh, more compact. Uh, I think the skins down at our Pinot Hill vineyard are darker than they are here at Hallberg, but I think we get a little more color out of Hallberg than we do out of the Pinot Hill. And I think it's partially due to the acidity that we get from Pinot Hill. And so that, that chemistry within the cluster, and I hate talking about it because David's uh, the winemaker, but the reality is the, it's just the acidity alone when we harvest the elite here at Hallberg, if the acid's usually, I want to say six, six and a half, and down there at, at Pinot Hill, that acidity can be over 10. And I think that affects the, the flavor from each of these clones as much as, as anything else, and that's climate related. I don't think it's as much soil related as it is climate related, but I'll, I'll hand it off to you, David, and you can respond to that. Well, I think you're exactly right, Kurt, um, that uh, the weather, the coolness down at Pinot Hill, uh, the cold wind that comes blowing in the afternoon, the lack of um, overall sunlight during the day or direct sunlight will affect how, how effective the vine can respire 
uh, the malate. So even though the sugars might be accumulating, it's just not respiring malic. So it, we can be, like you said, be picking that fruit down there at 10 grams per liter of acid, where at, here at Hallberg, it'll be between six and seven typically, because there's just a little more sunlight for that respiration to happen. Um, getting back to that slide that showed the 828 on the two locations, that's sort of a soil thing. Um, I guess maybe in lower areas, or Kirk, maybe you can address this better, but if there's better water holding capacity, you know, that, that, those vines can really pump up the size of the berries. So, you know, all other things being equal, if there's just more moisture retention in the soil, particularly with a clone like 8 to, um, 828 that starts off big anyway, um, you know, we have some vintages where they just, yeah, there there's that, go back to that next one, or that last one, Marty, yeah. there you go. Um, you know, those, those clusters just kept elongating and the berries just kept sizing up throughout um, the uh, ripening period. Some vintages where there's not as much water in the soil, the, the berries just stop sizing up, you know, basically, you know, pea or smaller, that's pretty much it. Um, other years are a little bit shocking just how, how much larger the berries continue to grow, again, based on how much moisture is down there. Yeah, so I think in terms of kind of the soil effect on the flavor and aroma, I think it also depends on the clone, right? So Dave was describing some clones that are very, uh, you know, unique in their expression of their character and some like 115 that can just drastically change depending on where it's planted or even, you know, in particular the vintage. It seems like from the discussion that we're having, which is something that's kind of been a revelation to me right now, that it seems to me that um, maybe you would both disagree, but that, uh, that what you're both saying is that climate is making a little bit of a bigger impact on the clonal expression than the soil. Although I think we would all agree that if we planted you know, 115 here and we planted 115 in Oregon, it is going to have a completely different expression, uh, but there, or, you know, maybe Elite, a better example, uh, will have a different expression, although there would probably be something so recognizable that's Elite. Um, yeah, but I think that, you know, soil is going to have an impact. You can see it even just in the, you know, 828 from the same property. Um, where we don't have as much of a climate difference, you know, within our same vineyard as we would between two different vineyards, um, but that will have an impact on it as well. Uh, so we've got a question here from Eric. So based on the look of the clusters, with several showing many more berries, uh, why would you not graft over the smaller clusters to typically larger ones to allow for more thinning of the fruit for quality? So I think he's looking at 37, hide, 115, and saying why, why wouldn't we just plant um, or graft over to some of those larger producers um, and then be able to thin versus um, going at it with fewer to start with? Well, if all things were equal, I wouldn't thin at all. Um, I prefer a vine, and this year is starting to look that way, I prefer a vine that's balanced with the canopy that it has. I, we still have to make money. Uh, there's a reality, we still have to make money. So I tend to prune for a little more of a crop and have the ability to thin as opposed to starting out with exactly what I want and uh, coming up short in a bad weather year. So uh, with that said, uh, the, the bigger clones, there's nothing wrong with the cluster size, the quality of the wine, but what you have to remember with clones, they provide a different profile. So like I was saying, 115 is floral in general. 777 and 667 adds some structure to that wine. And a, a grape like Pomard gives you a, a viscosity, a grapey flavor. And so what we want to hone in on is what qualities each one of those clones provide. We don't care what the size is. Uh, we still have, we know from past experience that our crop levels need to be with the clones, it's about the same, whether it's uh, two and a half to three and a half tons the acre. Anything over that's kind of dilute. Anything other than that is unbalanced. In other words, there's a whole lot of sugar. The vine has plenty of canopy, even though it's dry farm. But it'll push all the sugar through there, and it doesn't respire off the acid, and it doesn't develop the phenolics that we get with dry farming. So uh, I hope that answers your question. I'll defer to David if he has another one idea well i think you're you're exactly right kirk that um you know cluster count berry size uh 
cluster size, you know, clusters per vine, all those things yield. They don't necessarily, they don't tell the whole story. Um, you know, E2A, for example, that looks like, man, if you wanted to grow grapes, that would be the ticket right there. And <laughs> you, could thin it, you could thin it down and maybe make the kind of concentrated wine that you were um, hoping to make. But there's a, there's a character in E2A that is so primary and grapey that it's just, it's a gorgeous sort of background blue fruit wine, but it's not complete. It doesn't have the meatiness of 37. It doesn't have the floral notes of the 115. It doesn't have the spice from the 777 or the, that faded flower thing of the hide. So yeah, you might, you might get something that looks good on paper, but it's not going to make the most interesting wine. Um, yeah, um, and also, I just want to point out too, something yeah. that Dave said earlier too, uh, and Kirk also talked about, every vintage is going to be a little bit different and certain clones are going to shine in different um, conditions and you know being a farmer it's great to be able to hedge your bets a little <laughs> and you know we kind of have these backbones and you know flavors and textures that we like and rely on from our clones but knowing that um, you know we might have a really hot year and one clone is going to be a little bit more expressive and exciting from that year uh, you know gives us a little bit of an insurance policy for you know different seasons and different climates uh, or, you know, different um, vintages to be able to still make and produce, you know, a wine that is recognizable from the same vineyard. All right, we'll keep going. Oh, so we've got our Pinot Hill. So this, I think we've kind of already gone over this, which means that we're towards the end of our presentation. Uh, but looking at you know, kind of what can be different and similar about a clone. And typically we'd see similar uh, physical characteristics depending on where you are. I think this is a great example of that. Although looking back at this, you can see that 828 has similar physical characteristics between these two blocks, although the size is very different from the same vineyard. So I think that's always really interesting. And, you know, it's worth really remembering how Kirk was saying and Dave that, um, you know, the acid is going to make a big difference between these two uh, wines that are going to be made. Uh, it's not just the berry size and the cluster size, but it's the acid and it's the overall kind of physical characteristic. So there we go. All right. And it takes team. It's everybody, right? <laughs> it's not just the clones. It's also the people. It's also the site. It's all of it together. And that's kind of where we always end. Uh, feel free to ask more questions. I see that Michael just opened a Ruby Ruby uh, because it's just afternoon mountain time, which I think is almost, honestly a little bit late to be opening Ruby, if you ask me. <laughs> I always tell people our wine goes with everything, especially breakfast. Uh, if there's no more questions, feel free to drop them in right now. We'll get to them, but please join us. We are going to do this monthly and we're going to move it a little bit to Wednesdays. Uh, starting on June 10th, we're going to do it every second Wednesday of the month. So we will be sending you all information about registering for upcoming webinars and we get them all set up, but we are very excited. Uh, Dave next week is going, or next month, I should say, next one, uh, is going to talk with us about winemakers influence and choices and kind of how you can uh, manipulate or not manipulate even just choices like fermentation temperature um, we're not going to get into oak too much with this one we'll save that for another time but just save the date same time different date wednesday uh, and then we'll do it monthly from there dave do you have anything else to add for that one i don't but it's going to be okay. a good one there's so many <laughs> it will yep. we'll have a lot of fun indeed yep. Uh, all right, I don't see any more questions coming in. So Michael, enjoy that Ruby. I hope everyone else has something delicious to drink. And uh, we will see you on June 10th. We'll send out a reminder and we appreciate you spending your morning or afternoon or whatever time of day it is for where you are with us. And we really look forward to seeing you again next time. So thank you so much. Hope you all have a wonderful day.